a good time for me to drink some water. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are live, lately live. It's so exciting. Hey, David, how are you? I'm great. Hey, everybody. This is fun. I've never done a live one before, so I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth. Who knows? Oh, awesome. It's the best time. Well, so I wanted to just give everybody um, a couple minutes to log in and take, take us in visually. <laughs> it's good to like know what people look like in real life. Um, and then if you're on the chat, just a reminder to be chatting to all panelists and attendees if you want everybody to see it. If not, obviously use that little drop down. Um, David, you can see the chat too if you want to. It's on your screen somewhere. And if you want to ask questions, ask questions. I'll try to answer them or have David answer them. I'm Kate. I'm the CEO of Lately. And this is Lately Live. And I'm so excited about this particular show. So David, we were going to do this I think in October, but then we rescheduled and I picked the week of Thanksgiving very specifically because um, I think that what we're going to talk about today is going to be so apropos for family gatherings <laughs> this week. So let me start by, by doing a quick, oh, hey, Shirley, what's up? Great to see you. Let me do a quick intro of David and then I'll let him do most of the talking here, I promise, today. So um, please meet our, our friend, very much my friend. I'm so proud to call you my friend now. Um, also my customer, David Allison. He's the founder of the Value Graphics Database. This is what we're going to talk about today, which is the world's first custom database that can predict and influence behavior. And it contains insights from close to half a million surveys conducted in 152 languages, about 420 different metrics. So stuff like wants, needs, and expectations. Um, his best-selling book is called We Are All the Same Age Now. It's the end of demographic story types. And it was listed by Inc. Magazine as one of the top 10 leadership books of the year. Amazing. And it's been called a genuinely authentic contribution to the field of marketing literature. So this is what we're going to focus on today. This is actually revolutionary stuff. We haven't had this kind of a guest before today. So I'm very, very pleased to introduce you to David. Welcome, David. Hi, I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. That was a great introduction. I'm sitting here just, uh, my cheeks are burning. <laughs> awesome. Mission accomplished. <laughs> we'll try to achieve more of that today if we can. Um, so I want to start basic first, which is, um, let's just define, if you would, define demographics, and then we'll define um, value graphics. Does that sound, sound good? So, so tell yeah. us what, what, what are demographics? Okay, cool. Because this is basically a very classic problem solution story, right? The problem is demographics. Demographics is a system of understanding the people around us that we've been using since the beginning of time. Uh, back in the caves, when uh, pre-language, there were certain things that men had to do and certain things that women had to do. And there were certain things you had to do by the time you were 12 and by the time you were 14. And by the, and by the time back in those days, if you were 35, you were like the elder in the town. And your job was to sit wisely by the fire and tell people whether they were right or not. So those demographic stereotypes about who we are and how we behave and what our jobs are in society have stuck with us for millennia. And we're in this world right now where the whole world's being disrupted and we're pulling everything apart and putting it back together again and going, is there a better way for us to, you know, we have a sharing economy now and we've got cloud computing. And we've got all these different things that we're trying to figure out better solutions for. And yet this fundamental piece of every discussion, who are we? What are our jobs? What, are, what do we care about? What are our values? This is still reliant on this old, old, old system from thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago called demographics. So it's time for an update. It's time to disrupt demographics and to uh, think about better ways for us to understand each other moving forward. And you're doing that. And I just want folks to be clear on, on this exactly. So the way that um, marketers and companies use demographics, um, you know, they're, what they're looking at is age, um, race, religion, um, the language you speak sometimes, the location, like some pretty, I'm going to call them flat. Income, marital status, gender, number of kids, you know, occupation, uh, education, do you have a PhD or an MBA, uh, all those things. And we, we put people in those categories and then we think we understand who they are because apparently mm -hmm. everybody who has a PhD and is a woman and is uh, 40 years old is exactly the same and that <laughs> they all like the same stuff. It's ridiculous to say it out loud, but when you think about how 
everything begins. Everything begins in a boardroom. Somebody, when they sat around to make these Sharpie markers at some point, there was a few people in a boardroom and they said, who's going to buy Sharpie markers? Well, they're going to be uh, probably female and probably between the ages of this and this. And they have a job in, a, in, a, in an office uh, where they have a responsible for office supplies. Uh, and that, so therefore, uh, we're going to do these things. Uh, and we just make stuff up. And sometimes really smart people will like go back and look at historical information about a group of, of a demographic cluster and say, mm -hmm. well, we have a great customer database or we've scraped social media and we understand who these people are because this is the stuff they're talking about and this is what they actually care about. Well, that's only, all that is, is just a record of what we know about them so far and how they've mm -hmm. behaved so far. There's no clues in there that are reliable and predictable around how they might behave tomorrow. So when I'm, when I'm speaking to audiences, I'll say sometimes, I'll pick on someone in the front row. So if you ever come to see me speak, don't sit in the front row, you get picked on a lot. They say, you, lady in the red sweater, you drink three cups of coffee a day. That's a psychographic fact about you. And you're a woman and you look like you're about 18 and I get a good laugh out of that. So those are demographic facts about you. But it does, none of that tells me if I can get you to drink tea or if I can maybe convince you to stop having caffeine altogether because it's gonna be better for you and your health and your family. Like, I don't know any yeah. of those things about you until I understand what your values are. Once I know what you actually care about, how you make your decisions all day long, going through the rituals of your life, then I can influence how you might behave tomorrow. So you can have all the click data you want, all the geo tracking you want, all the statistics and, and demographics and all that stuff you want. And that's all cool to know, but none of it is predictive and can tell me for sure how you'll behave tomorrow until we understand what your values are. When I know your values, I know how you're going to make all your decisions going forward. And that's what value graphics is about. We've been able to empirically put enough data together in a way that we're able to predict what the values are for a particular group of people for these Sharpies or these glasses or anything anywhere in the world now and say the folks who are going to buy that thing or buy that product or service or brand, these are the things that are most important to them, regardless mm -hmm. of how old they are or their income or their education. Who cares about any of that? None of that matters. What matters is that they believe family is the most important thing in their life. So I can talk to them about glasses as it's going to relate to being able to, you know, be a better family person and have more time, quality time with their family. I got to find an angle around family to right. sell them my thing, whatever it is. You got to dive in so, more aggressively or I'll talk for nonstop for the next. No, hour. this is why well, we picked you. This is, this, <laughs> this is the you show. <laughs> Believe me. Um, and so your, your, the prediction is what's so fascinating here, right? Like it's one thing to say we can understand um, data, whether it's demographic data or, or value graphic data um, or data in general, just to understand people. But the fact that we're understanding what they're going to do next, like that's a really key factor. Um, I think one of the articles you sent me, they called it, business astrology which is sexy i think it undercuts it a little bit yeah <laughs> but I, give us some some examples of like what what the predictions are like and um like give me some numbers like how can this affect businesses okay so i'm going to do two things i'm going to tell you a little story that i use when i'm trying to explain why right. graphics are so powerful and i'll try okay. and tell a short version of the story because i can make it last for an hour so it's uh it's called three friends in an alley at midnight so three friends are out at a bar having a good time. They're having too many drinks because they haven't seen each other for a long time. And they probably had a few too many drinks, a few too many drinks ago. So they're just over the edge and they decide to leave. It's midnight. They're walking down the street and they're having a great time and punching each other in the shoulder and singing old college songs from their high school musicals. And whatever it is that they're doing, they're having a great time and they turn a corner and suddenly there's a dark alley and they have to make a decision. What are we going to do? So friend number one, the only thing we know for sure is that friend number one's primary value is adventure. And of course, friend number one wants to go down the alley because we're driving, we're having a great time. Let's go down there and see what happens. Friend number two, the only thing we know for sure is their primary value is safety. Let's get the hell out of here. We're drunk. I will, ah, let's go back to the bar. We turn on the lights, call the police. Friend number three, the only thing we know for sure is their primary value is friendship. I don't care if we go down the alley, go back to the bar, as long as we stick together. That's what matters is being with my friends. So those are three very logical decisions in that instance. I can imagine all mm -hmm. kinds of different people who would make one of those three decisions. It doesn't matter. None of those people had to check in with themselves to see if they were men or women 
or if they were married or had a PhD or earned $50,000. None of that matters. All we need to know is what their values are. And if we can know that scientifically and statistically for an entire target audience, now let's mm. flip that whole thing around. You're trying to get me to come down the alley and I know my target audience is all about adventure. Don't care anything about their demographics or past behavior. I got mm -hmm. the hook I need to get them to come down that alley. This is going to be the most exciting experience of your life. You've never seen an alley like this one. Wait until you see what we've put in this alley for you. I'm not telling you anything more. You have to come down here and have an adventure. Or friends, number Brilliant. two, that target audience, you can say to them, don't worry, we have policemen every two feet stationed on either side of this alley. There's cameras. When you get to the other end, there's people waiting with cake and donuts and they're going to hug you and it's <laughs> all going to be fine. Don't worry, super safe. We even padded the floor here in case you trip. You're just going to bounce. Great. And friend number three, what you have to say to them is, if you come down this alley with your friends tonight, it's going to be like last day of summer camp. You're never going to want to be away from those friends ever again. It's going to be the most bonding moment of your life with those two people. So we can tailor the message and even tailor the product and what we build and what kind of an alley we construct knowing what it is we're trying to trigger, what values we're trying to trigger to get people to behave the way we'd like them to. It's never been done before. I gotta, I gotta ask um, real quick, which one are you? Friend number one, two oh, or three? Oh gosh. Uh, I'm probably, I would like to think I'm friend number one, but I'm probably friend number two. I'm probably like, let's I'm get that one. Yeah, you're friend number one. <laughs> so, no, yeah, I mean, so we can go together. <laughs> um, so back to that idea, it's never done, be, done before, right? So, I mean, we hear revolutionary all the time and I, want, I used it in the promotion of this um, conversation because it was genuine. And, and as I was using it, I thought, I, I hope they, how do I convey that this is really actually revolutionary? Because it really is. I mean, you've got, you've got the world, literally the world of, in marketing for sure at your beck and call right now, pulling you globally. Your, your travel schedule is crazier than mine. And that's saying something. In fact, I think, weren't you just in the Middle East? Is that right? Yeah, I just got to speak in uh... I was in the Middle East for seven days. I had four speaking engagements, two in Dubai, two in Abu Dhabi. Uh, I got to talk to rooms full of people who uh, I had, I had preconceived. So it's really ironic, actually. I have, I stand up and say, let's stop using demographic stereotypes to understand people and start using what they truly value to understand people. And I was on that stage without even knowing it. I had a demographic stereotype in my head of what people in the Middle East are all about. And when they came to talk to me after I got off stage, people always want to come and say hi. I had a woman come up to me who I will never know what she looks like. She was wearing a burqa. All I saw was her eyes. And mm -hmm. she came up to me and stood right in front of me. And she said, I'm so glad you're here. I've read your book. I've seen all your videos online. I've read every blog that you've posted. I think your work is super important. Would you please sign my copy of your book? Oh my God. Like, wow. Uh, Every person I met on that trip absolutely shattered any thoughts I had of what I thought people from them. Why was I even going in there thinking that I knew what people from, that's like coming to the States and going, I know what Americans are. Like they're so, they're, it's crazy to think that you can think that way. But, but I was doing it until that moment where I kind of got slapped in the face by her and went, cut it out. Uh, I think we've all had that experience, by the way. I mean, I, I hope we've all had, it's, it's our nature to judge people um, on site, right? That's, I don't think anyone can avoid that experience, but I hope we've had the experience of like doing that and then realizing, you know, what, what well, happened. It's so inaccurate. You asked for stats a minute ago. I'll throw a couple of my favorite ones out. Yeah, Just please. Big juicy numbers here. So we That's have cool. uh, half a million surveys in the data set now. Uh, we have 420 metrics that we've measured, 152 languages. It's accurate to within plus or minus 3.5% and 95% level. Wow. of confidence. So this is like Harvard wow. stuff, right? This is bulletproof. And here's why. If you're a millennial consultant and you're listening to this show, uh, you're going to be sending me hate mail because millennials, they agree with each other on anything in our database, which is a measure of what it means to be human and alive on the planet in the year 2019. Millennials agree with each other 15% of the time. 85% of the time, millennials disagree with each other about everything. Now think about how many billions of dollars we've spent <laughs> trying to make stuff for millennials. 
You can't, unless you're happy with a 15% ROI on your, your dollars and your hours. <laughs> then you got a chance, right? But if you want to get the 85%, you got to understand what the people you're trying to motivate, what they actually care about. Who cares how old they are? Who cares about any of that stuff? The statistics all back this up. Men and women. So men only agree with each other 11% of the time. Women only agree with each other 10% of the time. So putting a group of women to get, say, okay, I'm going to target women. How? 90% of the time they <laughs> disagree with each other on everything and men are no better. And, and we look at every demographic label, age, income, gender, marital status, number of kids, education, all of them. They're the same kinds of super, super low numbers. It's, uh, it's, it, demographics are well and truly broken. They're a broken, broken system. And yet we still spend hundreds of billions of dollars a year based on demographic stereotypes. And if you don't believe me, go to a toy store and look at the blue toys and the pink toys and tell mm -hmm. me demographic stereotypes are still not pervasive in our world, right? They're, they're everywhere. Of course. The blue ones are generally cooler, I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's funny, like one of my pet peeves, um, my great pet peeves is when we go to dinner with another couple or, or couples and suddenly there's that divide off of women and men. And it's not that I don't like the women there as well, but like, I'm, I'm interested in what everyone is saying. I came to talk to everyone, you know, and like, I just, oh, I hate that. It just makes me so um, kind of crazy. And also like generally, I feel like there's something more fun happening <laughs> over there. <laughs> Just because it's over there, it doesn't mean if it's men or women, but like suddenly I'm, you know, divided by the over there. I think anybody um, who's ever met you knows that there's a giant tomboy streak that runs through you. So it's a, it's a very logical response to that. There's situation. that, there's that. Well, so on that note, um, just, you know, with the idea of um, women and men these days more than ever, there's a lot of blurry lines, you might say. Um, like, my question is, and I'm answering it, but which is a bad, um, a bad interview technique, but why now? <laughs> why now? Why is value graphics getting, getting the acceptance maybe that it's getting now other than the numbers, which are undeniable, but. I think, you know, the, the fact that we have the ability to look at a target audience for anything anywhere in the world uh, and be able to say, these are, this is what these people care about. That's powerful from a commercial perspective for sure. Um, it's as much as eight times more powerful. In fact, if we do the math and I can long boring conversation and tell you about that one day, but basically every dollar an hour you spend will be eight times more powerful. If you use a value graphic profile for your, your personas, your, 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 demo, your, your, your audience description, than if you use demographic. Don't dismiss that. Hey, hold on. Hold on. I want you to skip over that. Eight times more powerful if you're using value graphics versus demographics, which is what every marketer on this call uses all day long is the old way, demographics. Yeah. So if we're able to switch to value graphics, we're gonna see an eight times greater and, response. And all you have to do is like my, the, the tagline for my product for value graphics is just change the way you look at the world. You don't have to go and buy a bunch of stuff. All you gotta do is understand that people aren't the way you think they are and think about people differently and suddenly you can be eight times more powerful. Here's the basic math, so let's take a, Let's take millennials again, 15% agreement across all of our 420 metrics. Uh, Generation X is 11%, boomers are 13%. If we use a value graphics profile, however, for an audience, we can get the agreement level around those same 420 metrics as high as 89%. So every wow. dollar you spend is now an 89% potential ROI dollar instead of a 13% potential ROI dollar. So you know, the math's kind of fuzzy, but it's like seven, eight, nine, ten times better to be using values as a way to understand how people behave and how you can influence them than using demographic stereotypes as a way to do it. It's, uh, it's undeniable. And then what I like so to Jimmy, sorry, I got to finish that one. It's it, even please. if I'm half wrong and it's only four times better. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not. I'm sort of plus or minus 3.5% wrong. And we know that statistically. <laughs> it's a no brainer. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is, this is the way we all, we all must change. And so what I wanted to ask was, I mean, you have this big database and all these amazing surveys. Um, like what, what are the, what, some of the questions that you've asked? I'm just curious, like what are the questions that you're asking? And my next question will be like, how can the people watching, what questions can we ask? Right. So I want to first go back to the question I was about to answer before, because it was really important. Why now? Cool. I think our oh, thank world you. right now is so divisive. 
we're so we're, we're, we're fighting with each other to the point where if we don't have anyone to fight with, we're trying really hard to find someone to fight with because we need okay. to have someone to fight with. Otherwise, why do I wake okay. up in the morning? There has to be someone else to blame for my shit, right? Whatever's going on in my yeah. life needs to be someone else's fault. And this is global. I mean, refugee movements around the world, people are moving into other parts, they're running away from horrible atrocities and they're arriving somewhere else. They're being met with people who are like, get out of my country. I mean, there's, there's, we're doing all kinds of horrible things to ourselves in this planet. We're throwing single use plastics in the ocean. We're, we're, we're shooting each other. We're electing weirdos to run our countries. We're, we're doing all kinds of ridiculous stuff. And it's because we don't understand each other. We're scared of what we don't know. So this data set, yes, it will help the commercial world, but I'm so excited. We just finally, like one of my big goals has always been to get to a point where we can give this away to global humanitarian organizations doing great things in the world. And three weeks ago, I was, on, I was in New York and I got to speak and, and give data to the Environmental Defense Fund and we live streamed into their Washington headquarters. And so Value Graphics cool. is now out there helping the Environmental Defense Fund try and fix this poor planet of ours. I, Congratulations. And next, up, and next up and next up. I mean, I want to get to a point where there's other people helping me and I can just run around giving this away to, to groups that are doing good things in the world. That's my, that's my long-term goal. So there's that one. Uh, now you asked two other questions, which Thank you. totally have like just disappeared. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm keeping track because I'm writing it down. Um, and thank you for, <laughs> thank you for not letting us get ahead because this is important. Um, so what are some, what are some of the questions that you ask in your surveys? Like, hmm. how do you find out about values? Okay. So if you ask somebody about a value, they will lie to you. Uh, so mm -hmm. you have to ask them about stuff that they actually care about and get them excited about answering questions that have nothing to do with what you're really trying to find out. So here's an example. Let's say you're a hockey fan and I know this cause on your Facebook page, you're like hockey, 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 pucks, 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 like whatever it is. Right? <laughs> um, so Katie the, Jordan, shout out to you. Sorry, <laughs> go ahead. Fellow Canadian in the house. <laughs> so the, the, uh, the, the question that you would get that what would show up on your Facebook page, if we were trying to recruit you into our, into our um, data set, we'd get a little thing that popped up that said, listen, we're really trying to understand hockey and hockey fans and what motivates you and what you love about hockey. Would you answer a couple of questions? If we're asking you for your expert opinion around something, it's pretty hard to not click on that if you really are a hockey fan. So you'd click through and what we'd say is something, the questions would go, it's, a, it's called a question tree. It would be something like this. It would go, um, are you, you have a favorite team that you cheer for? Of course I do. If your team is knocked out of the series in the second game of, of the season, would you switch alliances and cheer for another team? No, I would never do that. Oh, okay, cool. But when your team is playing, do you watch all the games on, on television? I do. Does your family join you? No. Does your friends? Sometimes I'll go over to a bar and we'll do it together. Oh, cool. You go to bars. Do you actually go to them? in groups or do you arrive separately? Do you have a jersey? Do you wear it out? Do you go to games live? Do you bring clients? Do you bring friends? Do you travel to get blah, 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 hockey, 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 hockey? And you're just having a great time being an expert and telling me all about hockey. But what you're really telling me about is loyalty, friendship, mm -hmm. family, trust, drinking habits, uh, like all kinds of other uh, stuff. But if I just asked you how important is family, you'd say, well, it's incredibly important because that's what you think I want you to say. But right. by, by finding out from half a million people, metaphorically speaking, if family joins them at the hockey game or not, we know how people actually feel about family and whether family is a big part of the way they make decisions about moving forward with everything in their lives, whether family will convince them to go down that dark alley or not. <laughs> that's so funny. Um, my husband would never let me convince him to go down that dark alley ever. <laughs> Very good about that. Why you're a great team. <laughs> no, opposites of yeah, he stands his ground. Um, so my next question was, um, what are some of the qu questions that um, marketers on this call could use to maybe ask, um, do their own like mini value value graphics kind of survey? So here's the part where it gets kind of weird and awkward. Um, I need to tell everybody out there who doesn't know this, that when you sell a book on Amazon, you make about 50 cents. So what I'm about to do is tell you to go buy my book. And it's not because I want to make a bunch of money because if everybody in the world bought a book, I'd have enough to like, you know, buy a six pack of beer and a pack of smokes. So it's, it's keep, not about that. Keep talking. 
Okay, I'll keep talking. Keep, keep going. But in my book, there's a free survey that you can use. And you're making interesting noises. Oh, there's the book. Yay. <laughs> um, look at you. Look the right. This is fantastic. <laughs> and the next letter is, thank you, Alex. <laughs> um, the, Where's the, the survey? Book, there's a survey at the back, and it's 10 quick questions. You can send those out to whoever you want. Uh, use SurveyMonkey, whatever program, program you want to use. And then there's a scoring device in there. It says, okay, you got your 100 people, your 1,000 people to fill out the survey. Here's what the scores are. Here's how you add them all up. And then that directs okay. you to a chapter in the book. And that chapter in the book will tell you exactly everything you need to know in 10 big chunks. So it's the 10 biggest archetypes for the United States and Canada. Here's the 10 biggest groups. So what that quick little survey will do is help you understand which of the 10 archetypes is the most important for your audience. So at least you're starting to use values to make decisions about how to motivate them and, and influence their behavior. I always say it's like playing the piano with your fists. I mean, it, at least you're on the piano. It's not gonna be very, very elegant or sophisticated, but at least you're on the right instrument. And that's the best we can do in a book format. If you want more precise than that, guess what? You gotta call me up and we'll talk about doing that for you. But uh, for free, for free, for the cost of a book, you can have the, the, the playing the piano with your fists version, which is, again, you know, you, you'll, you'll find out that you need to head north and not south. Uh, and maybe even better, north by northwest is the direction you need to go to motivate your, your, um, your audience. And so it, it's, it's hugely valuable and you should absolutely be using it. I hope everybody does. Um, Katie, Chris, Lauren, can you guys find the link um, from Amazon and pop it in there for the book for everybody? So it's there. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we'll do that. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is really helpful and we just have a few more minutes. And so I want to, we touched on this um, before the call a little bit, but, um, or during the beginning, I think I want to, it's Thanksgiving, like I mentioned. And yeah. so Shirley just ordered your book. Awesome. Shirley's so awesome. Hi, Shirley. You're so great. Hi, Shirley. Love, you. I love you. I don't know who um, you are. <laughs> she's a really very smart marketer and a real sweetheart of a, of a cool. person also. Um, so I want to talk about Thanksgiving and I'm thinking like, so my parents are coming. I have, I have two sets of parents. I love, I love them all. We think differently politically. <laughs> um, and, but everybody's open-minded. We we're able to have really good discussions generally. And if I want to turn to my relative at the Thanksgiving table. And I want to ask them a value graphics question designed for me to learn something about them as opposed to judge them <laughs> and like have a real conversation. Like I'm putting in the spot. What, what should I ask them? Huh. Somehow you need to figure out, well, two things. You can't ask them directly what, what's important mm -hmm. to you because everyone will give you some sort of rehearsed, you know, Hallmark greeting card version of what's important in their life. Um, I think actually, Kate, I think you know. I think you would look at your aunt and go, she's all about status. Uh, I don't need to ask her a question. I need to tell her my stories and get her to do the things I'd like her to do based on triggering her values around status. I know that that's her thing. Uh, and that. you might look at your uncle and go, and his thing is friends. He's not so big on family or status. I got to I want to bond with Uncle Bob. I want to ask Uncle Bob how his friends are doing, how's like the the hockey league he's part of, how's the talk to him about that thing. That's the thing he cares about. You could walk out of Thanksgiving dinner essentially. You you already pretty much know what everybody's real core value is. If all you did mm -hmm. is start conversations with each one of those people based on that one core value that you know for sure is theirs, you would be the most popular person at dinner and you would be everybody's favorite relative for the next year. I think this is so great. And it sounds really obvious and cliche, but there's a difference between walking up to somebody and say, so what do you think about the impeachment process versus, you know, Hey, aunt Jeanette, I really love that necklace you're wearing. Where did you get that? Or, um, you know, Hey, like you said, um, I'm actually naming my own family now. Hey, um, Shannon, who is my sister, um, I noticed that um, you sent me uh, a link to buy cookies from your daughter's Girl Scouts thing. Were you involved in that? Are you teaching her how to sell them? Like that kind of thing. So just try to ask questions about something that you know that they care about. But, but let's talk about impeachment for a moment because you brought up the notion of okay. politics. 
minutes. Well, just for a very brief second here. I have to because it's Thanksgiving. You know everybody's going to be just like, it's wow. Be there, right? <laughs> I think yeah. uh, regardless of what your political um, leanings are, uh, what happened in the last election was that a certain candidate uh, stood up and realized a certain set of values in the country that had never that hadn't been activated in a very long time. People who were hungry to have someone say, "It's okay to think like that. It's okay to believe those things. Your values are valid." No one had said that mm -hmm. to them for a very very long time, and they're fiercely loyal now because their values were activated. That's the values are valid. The, that's I love the, that. That's the uh, you know. That's what happens. Whatever they are. Whatever they yeah. are. It doesn't really matter what, you, what, you, what you're trying to accomplish. If you activate those values and get people to believe that you believe that they are coming from an interesting, good place, you win. Thank God for food, too, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's always the old Because at least we can talk about that. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so on that note, we've, we're a little bit over, which is fine, um, but I'm so glad that we were able to do this, and I really hope that everyone here understands the power of this new, I'm going to call it science, I mean, because it's science, time out, keep going. I got to do one talk? thing before we okay, go. Okay, yeah, do it. I just need to tell you how important lately has been for me. <laughs> in the whole process. And don't, don't do that, don't do that, because you know you have been. When you have a big change like this that you need to try and make in the world, you need a big amplified voice. You need to talk to a lot of people about it. And as a solopreneur, you make that possible for me. So I, I, your product's great and it's amazing and all those things, but it's helping me change the way people look at the world. And I think that that needs to be called out and you need a big gold star for that one. Thanks. That makes me feel so good because, uh, yeah, we wonder when we're up again, when I'm standing next to someone like you who's actually changing the world, <laughs> then, it, then it, um, you're doing it, you're doing it, you're helping. Yeah, I'm speechless and I'm not even saying it well, but thank you, David, you've been so kind to us um, all along the way. And it's great to have partners like this. I mean, this is what it's all about, right, is just finding people that you're helping, whether it's in business or in um, conversations with your politically weird family <laughs> or whatever it is um, but but that's what it's all down to so um, so thank you so much I feel like this is a super special lately live and thanks to all of you as well um, the next one is going to be wonderful as well I'm I'm about to write it up so we're going to promote it soon but we'll have a, another I think it's Ivana Taylor is our is our um, upcoming guest so we'll have some more people coming in December and then a very special guest in February that I'm going to just say she's a, it's a she, and she's a prominent TV person. Ooh. So testing, testing, it'll come soon. Anyways, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. Thank you so much, David. And um, www.trylately.com is us. I'm Kate. I'll see you next time on Lately Live. Bye, Thanks. everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.